are you ready for worship? Yeah! Well, thanks for give, letting Lisa and I get away. Our trip was just under 4,000 miles. Uh, we drove it. We didn't fly it. We drove to San Angelo and visited friends from ministry 40-some years ago. And then we went up and put my daddy's ashes, who had been in a closet for nine years. We put them in uh, the Milner Family Cemetery in Perrin, Texas. And then uh, went and visited a friend from Ohio State who... Uh, is younger than me, but retired a few years ago, and I'm just like, this ain't fair. And then we went and uh, I buried a friend from my Air Force days up in uh, uh, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Thank you, Lisa. And then uh, we visited the kids in Chattanooga, and then we came back to Florida. And all that, to say I'm tired and I'm sorry for this morning. <laughs> uh, I understand that we sang God Bless America last week, but you know what? Uh, the 4th of July is the birth of this nation, and we do want God to bless America, but the truth is uh, we need to understand it's because of the brave that we are free. Would you please stand? And if you don't remember the etiquette, please place your, hand over, your right hand over your heart and let's sing the star-speckled banana. Oh, I say, by the dawn so proudly we hail at the twilight's last moon, whose hearts and bright stars is the Agenda. Do we have an agenda? We do. Here's Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. We're going to uh, continue this uh, attitude of gratefulness. We are so, aren't you grateful that you live in, in America? Yes. Amen. I hear people bad mouth in our country because they don't agree with the politics, but you know what? That flag stands for freedom, it doesn't stand for politics. I don't right. care what your politics right. are. God is bigger than the donkey, and God is bigger than the elephant. Amen? Amen. All right, let's worship that God together, singing, uh, Raise a Hallelujah.
God to glory. You may be seated, uh, and as our leader comes up to lead us in the Nicene Creed, I just want to say, you know, today's focus is all about uh, the eye of the storm. Uh, you guys are familiar with a hurricane or tornado, right? So uh, where are the winds the fiercest? No, no, outside of the eye. If you've ever been in, Lisa and I realize we've been in like 12 hurricanes and since 19... 89 when we moved here. I mean, we seem to move across the state. Now that we're here, sorry. I <laughs> but you guys have got a track record, so it's not all on us. Okay. But it's in the eye. It's in the eye where things get calm. And as it's calm in the eye of the storm, the storm is still raging all around you. And so my basic thrust in today's time together is to make you understand that no matter what storms you're facing in your life, you need to turn and walk towards the center of life, which is Jesus Christ. Yes. He is the Prince of Peace. This is the way you can cope. This is where you will find strength and peace and a place to restore and renew your own strength. You'll find it in Christ. You try to fight your battles alone, you're going to wear out. If you try to face the enemies that live around and within you, you're going to lose. You've got to run to the center of the storm where Christ is. We just sang that you're going to raise a hallelujah. You're going to use your weapon as a melody. That hallelujah singing praise to God no matter what's happening in your life. And that's where you'll find peace. I tell you what, this is a creed which means it basically says this is what I believe. Would you stand to your feet and let's read this creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will not end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing and we will sing 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord. Give God the glory. Yeah. yeah.
You guys sound like a church choir. Have a seat. Uh, I did fail to uh, offer the greeting to those online and you in person here in worship. If you're a first-time visitor, make sure you get one of our mugs. Uh, today is communion. I want you to know that we practice an open table. You don't have to be a member of Roseland Church. You don't have to be part of the Global Methodist Church. You just simply have to love and desire to be in fellowship with God and all those neighbors that God has given you to see, to hear, to touch, to feel, uh, to make life better for all of us. Um, there is a, a card that you should have received when you came in, a Connect card. Make sure you fill that out. I freely admit I've got two weeks worth to go through, so a third week, I, I, yeah, I'll get to them. Uh, but I do lift each card in prayer, and then anything that you put on the back, I'll lift up in prayer specifically. So uh, with that being said, uh, Dee, you're going to come and lead us in our congregational prayer? Please bow your hearts with me. Father, we are your people. As we meet together in this place, help us to listen, to understand, and to remember. Make us aware that we are meeting not simply with one another, but with you. Let your presence be real to each of us. As we pray, may it be just like speaking with you. As we listen, help us to concentrate so that we really hear your word and help us to take in and retain all that we hear, see, and experience this morning. Here are confessions of those things we have done. Here are confessions of those things which we ought not to have done. Now, here are confessions of what we could or should have done in a different way to reflect who you are in us. Here now are praise and thanksgiving for your blessings and unearned grace given to us. It is in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son, that we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. And now we've got a changing of the guards. Yes. Uh, you know, how many of you have been praying the Lord's Prayer since you were a child? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it's you can call it a rubric if you want to, which is simply something that reminds you of a greater truth uh, for a long period of time. That's what a rubric is. But inside of the rubric, the Lord's Prayer, is a great truth, many great truths. Uh, but the one that I want to camp on today is I want to just suppose for a minute with you that maybe the tempest, the storms in your life revolve around pride. They revolve around when your ego is hurt, when you didn't get what you felt you deserved, you didn't uh, feel as if you were heard or valued, and so you nursed a hurt until it became a grudge, until it's become something that's just part of who you are today. And then every time we pray that rubric, we pray the prayer the Lord taught us, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And no matter how you slice that, it means this. It means that I need to understand that I have a forgiven heart so that it can be softened so that I can forgive other broken hearts. Does that make sense? That is the truth of not just the Lord's Prayer, but the central truth of all of life. As we bump and bruise each other, we do it in the workplace, the marketplace, we do it in the home and the neighborhood. And so you just have to live life with an open hand, not a closed fist. So would you please stand and sing 
To God be the glory. Because when you do that, that's exactly who receives the glory. just sang about the words of the Christ and the great things he did on Calvary's cross which was to not only die for our salvation for removing our sins but to take away a bent towards sinning to take away our desire to get even or one up somebody who's injured us you know some of the last words Jesus said from the cross at Calvary was father forgive them for they what turn to your neighbor and says I don't know what I'm doing And that's the truth. So when you, uh, what's that What's that country western song I like? I like a lot of country westerns. What the ones, uh, God is great, beer is good. People are. We are. We do things that we shouldn't do. We don't do things we should do. God is great and people are crazy. It's just the way it works. Um, what is that that's on the screen right now? Matter of fact, for those of you who remember, that's a Cat 5. Had a name, Andrew. That was one to remember, huh? The truth is, there's storms in life. Storms in your health, storms in your wealth, storms in your relationships. So what's at the center of that storm right there? The eye. And that's what needs to be in the center of your storms. You know, the idea, the eye of the storm is represented in the Bible. It's represented every time it talks about God as our refuge and our strength. It's a place where we need to run to when the world doesn't make sense, when chaos is reigning supreme. It's a place when we don't have the energy to get up and try again. In any aspect of what it means to be you right here, right now, that's when we need the refuge and we need to find the strength that's in the I, which is the center of God's will for our life. Because it's only in the eye that you'll find peace and comfort, contentment and strength, no matter what the category of the storm is that you're facing right now. And you know, you might still be young in the faith and naively believe, as many do when they're new to Christ, that when you come to Christ, things will get easier. How many of you that have been in Christ for a while found that to be true? No. In fact, you have to face and confront things inside of you that you could easily ignore before. In fact, you have to face and confront things around you that you just accept it as being normal, but now they just make your stomach churn and make you sick. You see, when you run to the center, when you run to Christ, 
when he t truly does become your refuge and strength, your Lord and your Savior, then your worldview changes. But you're not removed from your world. No one is exempt, not even the Apostle Paul. Read this with me, would you? Even though I have wonderful revelations from God, stop right there. Even though you've experienced God's blessings, even though you've heard God's voice when you've sat down in a devotion or reading God's word, uh, you've experienced the powerful presence of God, you still have a thorn in your flesh. Maybe two, maybe ten. So let me ramp us up and you join me in the, the second part of that sentence. Even though I have wonderful revelations from God, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from getting proud. So stop right there. Unless you look at what you're reading, you'll skip over the truth. Does Satan want you to be proud? Oh, yeah, baby. I don't need God. That was Satan's lie that he told in heaven. He wanted to be like unto God. He, he didn't need a God. He didn't want the Lord is my shepherd. He didn't want a shepherding presence. He didn't want a, a guiding voice. He didn't want a strength beyond his own strength. He wanted to do it on his own. Who is that famous singer from New York? I did it my way. Uh, yeah, okay. So you were a hurricane hunter flying out in the storm. That's great. I'm glad you could do it, Frankie boy. But most of us wear out. Most of us, when we're young, think we're bulletproof and we can do whatever we want to do, wherever we want to do it, with whoever we want to do it with. And my friends, later in life, especially when you come to find Christ, those will become thorns in your flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment you and keep you, <laughs> if you're on your knees before Christ, from getting proud. Let's finish that together. Three times I begged the Lord to take it away. So he's saying, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. So what was he doing? He was praying like Christ prayed in Gethsemane before his crucifixion. He was praying so hard that tears, like blood, fell from his eyes. Have you ever prayed that hard over an issue in your life or the life of someone you love? Some of us prayed many years for an issue in our life or the life of someone that, that we care about, family, friends. But have we prayed fervently? The fervent prayer of a righteous one availeth much. It's not just throwing words at heavens. It's about laying your heart bare before God. God, this hurts. It hurts like this and this and this. God, it generates fear inside of me. It generates guilt and shame inside of me. God, I can't live like this. If you need examples of those prayers, read David's Psalms after he sinned with Bathsheba. Three times I begged the Lord to take it away, and each time he said, what? In other words, run to the center. Don't keep trying to stand up in the middle of the storm. Run to the center. Use what strength you have left to crawl to Calvary's cross. Because His grace is all you need. And everything else is a lie from Satan to make you proud. To think you can do it alone. And not just without the Holy Spirit, but to do it alone. You don't need your family and friends after all. You're going to do it your way. But then read the cherry on top of that Sunday message right there. My power works best. How many of you like to, how many of you like to appear to be weak? How many of you like to be weak? How many of you understand deep in your heart when you're not trying to pose for yourself in the mirror or anybody else in the world that you are weak? You are. And when we isolate ourselves from godly men and women, godly counsel, we become extremely weak and very vulnerable to all the storms of life. <sighs> My grace is all you need. I know that, but in the storms of life, I often forget. And so instead of turning and looking for Christ in the middle of my turmoil, I turn and look at the tempest. And my God diminishes in the face of my fear or guilt or shame or anger. 
Friends, listen to me. How many of you have ever used a microscope? So you take that little slide and you put spit on it or an amoeba or, I don't know, botulism, I don't know, whatever you played with. And you slip it under there and it, it's immediately in focus, isn't it? So what do you have to do? You have to adjust it. And that's true in life. Life throws things at us that we don't expect, that we're not prepared for. And so if you don't adjust your focus, then you're going to feel lost. It's essential for things in life to work. This idea of focus, where your focus is. Whether you're studying or reading or learning or listening or building a relationship, you've got to have focus. But you know, you can be too focused. What happens if all you do is turn that vernier knob back and forth? Do you ever really focus? No, you don't, because you're so busy fiddling with the widgets. I remember, you don't need to know this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> back at AT&T, when the internet really was being made and Al Gore wasn't involved, uh, <laughs> um, we, we were final, uh, in our final stage of choosing to move away from the 3B2 Unix computers, uh, and it was between Cisco and Wellfleet routers. And all of my engineers loved the Wellfleet routers. You know why? Because they had all kinds of widgets you could fiddle with. You could fiddle with the, uh, everything that had anything to do with anything. And the Cisco routers could be designed to where you could teach people in a relatively short period of time how to build and maintain a network. And it took everything in my back pocket and many other people's back pocket to choose Cisco. Because it would create a resilient network. It would create a network that included the customers in the care of their own networks. That was my last job as a product manager of NetCare for AT&T Paradise. And all the fiddlers, all the ones that like to constantly adjust, were really upset. We made the wrong decision, but we didn't. And Wellfleet is now a footnote in history, and Cisco owns the Internet. You see, you can get so focused on focusing that your life's out of focus. You can be so content with constantly adjusting your relationships and your job, your career, your skill set, that you never actually live the life that's there in front of you. Think of, think of it this way. How many of you can type? How many of you can really type? I'm impressed. How many of you type like this? Anybody willing to admit it? How many of you on your, uh, how many of you on your cell phones go, and you've written the Gettysburg Address? Me, I'm like, but I type 90 words a minute with no error. I can't transfer that skill from the typewriter, the computer, to a cell phone. So here's the deal. Some of you are living your life like it's a typewriter and you refuse to learn to type. Or think of it this way. How many of you have a newer car? New for you, maybe since 1968, I don't know. But Lisa and I rented this Cadillac because we were on a drive so far. All I said is I wanted a Nissan Maxima because we drive an Altima. And I didn't want to put all those miles on my car. And this is a, you know, a free tidbit. Take it with you. You know, after a 4,000-mile trip, it was their miles, their tires, their oil change. I mean, you, you start taking that away from the cost of it, and it's like, they gave me money. <laughs> but that Cadillac had all kinds of bells and whistles. You know, you stray too far from the lane, what would happen? Bing, 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 bing. Or if you, you the worst, <laughs> Lisa knows exactly. First time I nearly came out of the chair. <laughs> what engineer? Guarantee it was a female, not a male. Just putting it out there. When you get too close and going too fast to somebody in front of you, your seat buzzes in exactly the wrong place. I had no idea what was going on, but I did not like it. I lost focus on the car ahead of me. We can do that when things in our life that are really close and personal to us begin to rattle. <sighs> I 
My friends, I want to ask you a very serious question this morning. Where is your primary focus? Now, I know it changes. In the first half of life, Bob Buford says that we strive for success, and in the last half of life, we strive for significance, and I think that's true. My question for you, no matter which season, the first half of life, the second half of life you're in, my question for you this morning is, where is your, your, your real focus? See, it took me a long time in life to make my focus Christ. I mean, I went to church. I did all the churchy things. I read the Bible. I you know, got quarters for memorizing Jesus with. Anybody else do that? Yeah. But the truth is, Jesus was an add-on. My faith was something that when I had time, I'd try to work a little bit of it in. And so when the inevitable storms of life came, I was tossed about just like everybody else. Where is your primary focus this morning, right now? Is your main focus pleasing God? No matter how young or old you are, no matter how rich or poor you are, no matter how spiritual or dumb as a post you are, here's a spoiler alert. Anything else other than making God the center of your life will lead to chaos because it will lead you out of the eye of the storm, out of the peace of Christ, into the turmoil of the world. It just will. The Bible talks a lot about storms. In a storm, things can become chaotic. It's in the storm that fear becomes real. It's in the storm that our need to survive overcomes our common sense. It's in the storm that we can become lost and forget who we are and whose we are. It doesn't matter. Read it with me. Jesus was in the stern of the boat sleeping. Don't you hate it when the guy's in the back just sleeping? You know, I'm watching a perfectly good ball game and, and I fall asleep and then I wake up and it's over. And Lisa has no idea who won. <laughs> You know, clearly I handed the baton to you. It sounded like this. <laughs> Jesus is in the stern of a boat. They were out on the Sea of Galilee, which is a treacherous body of water. And when they started, it was calm, just like for most of us when we came to Christ. But inevitably, the storm came up. It came up quickly, and it was ferocious. And Jesus was in the back sleeping. So the disciples woke him. Don't miss this. That's a pivotal point in this story. Some of you are in the middle of a tempest and you haven't woken Jesus. You know? Well, I've still got a couple of things I'm going to try, but then I'll pray. I've still got a, a little more oomph left in me before I say I am too weak to deal with this alone and pick up the phone or write a text to a friend who's deeply into Christ and will pull me out of the waves. So the disciples woke him, read it with me, would you? Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Don't, 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 don't pass judgment on them. We're the same way. We know Jesus is compassionate. We know that Jesus cares for us. We know that God in Jesus Christ died for us on Calvary's cross. So obviously we know that Jesus cares for us. But still, the storms of life come. They come in our finances. They come in our relationships. They come in our health. They come in our politics. Don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if, if we're in danger? So what did Jesus do? Read it with me. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Be quiet, be still. Stop right there. He didn't just rebuke, rebuke the wind and the waves. Who else did he rebuke? And that's the hardest rebuke of all. And it's not done with anger in his eyes. Don't see that because it wasn't there. It's not done with hurt in his heart. Don't feel that because it was not there. Not then for them and not for you now. He's saying, my child, I've been waiting. I have been waiting right here with you in the middle of the storm, waiting for you to call out to me so that I could come and rebuke the waves, and rebuke the wind, and remind you that you can trust me. I will not 
failure. It may not turn out exactly like you want, but I will not fail you. I will never leave nor forsake you. Do you still have no faith? Faith is, is found in the center of the storm. Faith is found in Jesus. Faith is tested in the winds and the waves of life's challenges. But peace is found in Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of the storm. He's the one that stands and rebukes the storm and it quiets. It doesn't mean that life is always going to go according to the way you want it. It's not always going to be smooth sailing. My life hasn't been. I suspect yours hasn't either. The Apostle Paul talked about this thorn in his flesh. He discovered that God will use the storms of our lives to test our resolve and to lead us to where he wants us to go because many times I know I don't want to go where God's leading me and I suspect there's many times you don't want to go where God is leading you. You know, Paul was shipwrecked not once but twice. And in his shipwrecks, he led people to Christ. You want to know to the point of many of the storms in our lives? Really, as a Christ follower, every storm in our life is to witness to the power of God, Jesus Christ. The hope that defies what we are facing in the world in and around us. It's the genuine witness when people look at us and expect us to be coming undone. They say, how can you be so calm? And you turn and you give them a genuine smile with kind eyes and say, it's Jesus. It's not me. You're not witnessing my strength. You're not witnessing my courage. You're not witnessing my resolve. You're witnessing me turning to Jesus in the stern of the boat, saying, Lord, I know you care. Please stay in it. You see, peace, friends, I need you to get this. I really do. Peace depends on our focus, but not our power. If you focus on the chaos, if you lock your eyes on specific people or politics, health or financial issues, you'll end up lost in that chaos. Is that really where you want to be? But you can choose to join Jesus, the God of the storm, and find peace in the center. John 15, 33, read it with me, would you? Jesus said, I have told you this so that you will have peace in me. You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. He's not saying buck up. He's not saying suck it up buttercup like my little sister Lynn says to me. <laughs> He's saying take heart. Whose heart? His heart. His heart. In this world, you will fall. You will fall be pushed down in ways that you are hard that will be hard for you to forgive those who've pushed you down. In this world you will fail in ways that are hard to forgive yourself for that failure. But peace is found in the Christ no matter what the cause of the storm. Peace is not found in them no matter what they say or promise. Peace is not found in you no matter what you say. Or promise. Peace is found in Christ. Take heart. His heart. And his peace will be in you. Friends, I know that's true because it's worked for me. You know, the old hymn says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I hate three steps or three points in a poem, but here it is. It was a long week. <laughs> three steps towards peace. Read the first one with me. Accept what you can't change. Pride says you can. Logic says I probably can't. 
And Christ says, I don't want you to. I don't want you to be like Satan and buck up saying the world should be this way, but the world is this way. It is what it is. It'll be what you make of it. If you make it a rock upon which you break your faith, if you make it a rock upon which you break your hope, if you make it a rock upon which you shipwreck your soul, God will allow you to do that. It'll break his heart. How many of you can change the past? How many of you act as if you can't? By holding a grudge or being angry or disappointed? How many of you can change another person? Don't you turn and look at your husband. <laughs> the truth is you can't even change your child. Oh, you might replace their diaper once in a while, but you can't change them. In the middle of the chaos, find a devotion. In the middle of the chaos, reach out to a friend and say, I'm at my rope's end. Can you come and watch these brats for a while? Lisa and I do that, by the way. Feel free to dump your kids on us. And it's amazing how much better kids behave with somebody else. And no matter what it is, ask yourself, will this matter in three or five or ten years? Take some of the tempest out of the storm. <sighs> Pride. I can do this. I can do this on my own. Pride is the enemy of peace. Say that with me. Pride is the enemy of peace. So you must... Practice forgiveness. Feeling hurt, even angry, when someone wrongs you is understandable, but holding on to grudges will not lead to inner peace. It just won't. <sighs> forgiving ourselves is hard. Much harder than forgiving others. You're on the path of self-forgiveness if you've apologized. But if you're still standing in your pride and saying, well, I can't admit I did wrong, then that path is blocked and you will remain in the outer bands of the storm. <sighs> and once you've apologized, you've got to do your best to amend the wrong, to make things right without causing further harm. And then you've got to commit to change your behavior. See, at the end of the day, to find the peace at the center of life's storms, to come alongside Jesus means that you learn to obey Jesus. If you love me, Jesus says, you will obey my commandments. And you'll learn to accept that you're not a throwaway person and no one else is either. And you'll understand, at least in passing, why the Christ would die on Calvary's cross for you and for me. I know I'm not worthy. Maybe I hope. You suspect you're not worthy of the death of God's one and only Son, but he did die for us. So we've got to practice forgiveness. We've got to let go of the emotional baggage. We've got to let go of the physical distress and the chaos of life as it surrounds us. And the only way really to do that is to practice the presence of God. How many of you are suspicious of the medical profession? They're still practicing. Give them a break. <laughs> I just wish they wouldn't charge me so much for their practice. <laughs> what are some of the ways you can practice the presence of God? Devotions? Others? Prayer? Very important. Others? How about instead of having the Bible as a decoration on the nightstand, you actually opened it. Start out once a week, and then maybe go to once or twice a day. You don't have to read, you know, 14 chapters in a setting, but just open it up and trust that the Holy Spirit will guide you to where you need to be. Get some of those little cheaters that say, when I'm anxious, look at these 32 verses. You don't have to look at them all. Just say, God, I need you now. And read it. 
when you're fearful, do that. And when you're angry, do that. And when you're apathetic and you don't see the point and the purpose in mind, go to the verses that will encourage you so that you'll remember that God loves you. And he has a purpose and a plan for your life. Focused prayer increases mindfulness, making you aware of who you are in the middle of your life right now, making you aware of who you were in the middle of the life that you've lived and can't change. Intentional prayer will help you acknowledge, accept, and let go of your past, embrace your presence, and allow you to live your best life beginning tomorrow. Read Psalm 4610 with me, would you? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God will be exalted. The question is, will you be singing God's praises in the middle of the storm? Or will your voice be drowned out in the chaos of life swirling around you? If you have been struggling to find focus in your life, something that will not change no matter what happens. Can I suggest that Jesus could be what you're looking for? Here's the last verse of that pericope we looked at, 2 Corinthians 12. Read verse 9 with me. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may work through me. You all admitted, and hopefully you didn't lie in church, but at the top of this message you admitted that we don't like to appear weak. We don't like to feel or be weak. Can we possibly grow to where the Apostle Paul did with those three thorns in his flesh? Or the thorns in his flesh that he prayed three times to heal relief? Can we move to a place where we can boast about our weaknesses? Not to say, oh, you think that's bad, take a look at this scar. Not like that. But to say, you know, I was broken. This is what the power and the presence of God did for me in Jesus Christ. You know, that's the power of a church. That's the power of a Christian. To be able to take your past and put it on a pedestal that says, God took me from that to this. We're going to do communion. I've already mentioned that uh, you don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a global Methodist. The truth is, this is Christ's table. And he wants you to remember that it's his strength that you need. He wants you to remember that no matter how you failed in your own strength and doing it your way, that it can be forgiven, that you can be restored and redeemed and renewed. So I pray that you will set aside your pride, whatever form it takes this morning, and simply come to this throne of grace. Inside of your uh, handout, you have some words. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he gathered in an upper room with his closest friends, and he told them that one of them was going to betray him. And none of them could believe it, even the one who knew in his heart that he was about to sell him out. That's true for each of us here today. All of us basically think we're pretty good people. We may not be perfect, but we're basically, you know, a pretty good Joe or Joe. But the truth is, Every time we choose our way instead of God's way, we have betrayed the Christ. We've added our sin, not just our past sin, but the sin we're about to commit or in the middle of committing right now. We've added that to the weight of Christ on the cross of Calvary. 
You need to hear those words echo from 2,000 years ago. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. The truth is, if most of us would stop, preferably just before the sin or just as the temptation comes, and we played it out to the end on what could or is most likely going to happen, we would know, and we wouldn't do. I challenge you to think about that as you live on the margins, as you live on the edge of the storm, I challenge you to draw a little closer to the eye of the storm. He took a piece of bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body that is broken for you. Our bodies are broken. Mind, spirit, soul, emotions. We're broken. But he says, this is my body broken for you to heal your brokenness. So this morning, take and eat. Don't just consume a few calories, but understand that your brokenness is being mended. And after the supper, he took the cup, and again he offered thanks to the Lord for everything good comes from the hand of God. And he gave it to them then and to you now, saying, drink from this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant. It's his blood, but it has to have your signature. For your name to be written in the Lamb's book of life. For your name to say, account paid in full. You have to receive what Christ alone can offer. He said, drink from this, all of you. Because he doesn't want to lose any of you. So, Lord, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for this hurting world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory be yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. And all God's kids said, Amen. For those who are going to help serve communion, please come forward. And I did it again. Where's the, you got it? She's always got it. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my goodness. open. The table is open. There'll be a station in the back, two at the front. Come as you feel led by the Spirit. Feel free to kneel at the altar if you'd like or go back and commune in your seat. But really, I desperately beg you to consider the storms of your life and how coming to the center, coming to the Christ in this moment will give you peace.
You saw me smiling up here from time to time. It's because Ron was showing off how fit he was. When a little child would come up, he'd kneel down <laughs> and serve them. You know, what an image of Christ. Kept in America. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we have laid before you our hearts. We have presented ourselves as a vessel to be filled, a cracked pot to be healed. Father, draw us to the center, to the eye of the storm that is each of our individual lives. Allow us to receive a calm that it can only come from the peace of Christ and to take that calm and share it with a world that desperately needs faith, hope, and love. And all God's kids said, would you please rise to your feet and let's sing something, leaning on the everlasting arms. <laughs> What a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting God. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What to your next steps. Where'd she go? Oh. How's the summer going, everyone? 
everybody? Yeah? It's hot, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? God is good all the time. And, all and the I time. don't, all the time, God, God is, is good. good. I don't know if you noticed, but our front sign has been fixed. It Yay! looks beautiful. Um, so thank you guys for fixing that. It's wonderful. Um, today, just so you know, the youth group and the Sunday school kids are all invited over to Ms. Christian's house for a swim party. So what we, time is that? Yeah, at noon. Yeah, noon. At noon, Come at noon o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, just so you know, we are still doing Pastor's Journey of a Lifetime Bible Study. It is held on Tuesdays at 6.30. And, and we invite everyone to come. Even though if you didn't start from the beginning, it's okay. Just come anyway. It is an amazing time to learn a little bit more about that book that we all depend on, the Bible. And um, I think that's about it that's for it. now. It's all been right. a, it's a, it's a quiet summer. The roof is going up. Yes. Woo! Woo! Have you guys seen it? Do you like the blue? Yeah, it looks good, doesn't it? So now when you try to explain to people where your church is, it's the one with the blue roof, and they'll go, oh, yeah, I know that place. Would you please rise for the benediction? May the God of all grace surround you. May the Christ who died for you fill you with hope, and may the Holy Spirit guide you this day and every day hence. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's kids said, Amen. Amen. Have a beautiful week.